Great, hallelujah. Well, last week, David Lynn gave us a very powerful message about how the church has been compromised in these last days. So to follow on from that theme, we're going to look at what the Bible said about how the church would look in these last days. Please turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, a.k.a. the lukewarm church. Revelation chapter 3. Now, let me explain how these letters work, because you have seven letters here from Jesus to seven different churches in Asia Minor. Now, these churches were seven literal churches which existed in the first century, but scholars are unanimous that what these actually represent, they actually represent seven different stages throughout church history. There's a number of things you can go into about this. I'm just going to give you a brief overline of how these epistles line up with how the church has looked over the last 2,000 years. They literally correspond to seven different stages of church history throughout the last 2,000 years. Now, as I said, they are seven literal churches which existed in the first century, but they also do correspond to those seven different stages throughout church history in the last 2,000 years. So, for example, the first, the first epistle there is to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, which, of course, represents the early church formed by the apostles. The next one is the church in Smyrna, corresponding roughly to 100 AD to 300 AD. Now, this was the era of persecution. This is a great era of persecution which the church suffered under various Roman emperors. That's why it says in this epistle that you'll be thrown into prison and suffer tribulation. The next one is the church in Pergamum, which corresponds roughly to 300 AD to 600 AD. This was where the church became a political entity under Constantine, hence why it says that this is where the seat of Satan is. The church in Thyatira. Now, the the church name often reveals its character. The meaning of the Greek name often reveals the character of this church. Now, Thyatira, this corresponds to about 600 AD all the way through to 1500. Who was, in, uh, who was reigning then? It was the Catholic Church, wasn't it? This is the era of the Catholic Church. Thyatira means continual sacrifice. That's what the word Thyatira literally means, continual sacrifice. What do the Catholics do? The Mass, which is considered to be the continual sacrifice of Jesus Christ, based upon an absolute butchering of John chapter 6. But that is what they believe, a continual sacrifice which they partake in, called the Mass. And also, this is where Jesus says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is the one, if you remember back to when I spoke about Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel is the one who introduced idolatry to the kingdom of Israel. Who was it who introduced idolatry to the church? The Catholics. Worship of Mary, bowing down to statues. This came through the Catholic church. Hence why Jesus says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. And the meaning of the name Thyatira, meaning continual sacrifice. So that corresponds roughly to about 600 to 1500 AD. After that you have the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis corresponds to about 1500 to 1700 AD, which of course was the Protestant Reformation. This was the era of the Reformation, hence why Jesus says, I find your works incomplete. The Reformation was incomplete, wasn't it? That's why we still have in Protestant churches, still to this day, infant baptism, stained glass windows, Catholic-like things. It all comes from the fact that Protestantism did not reform completely the church. It was incomplete. That's why Jesus says, I find your works incomplete. After this is the church of Philadelphia, corresponding roughly to 1700 to 1900 AD. Now, Philadelphia was the faithful church. Jesus says, you have kept my word. And of course, during this this era, it was a very strong era. It was a very faithful era of the church. Some of the greatest men of God came from this era. So that corresponds to the church in Philadelphia. Now, as I said, there's several parallels you can draw between all of these seven churches. Uh, There's so much more we could go into, but I'm just giving you a brief overview of how these churches line up with the seven different stages of church history in the last 2,000 years. But there's none more where you can draw so many parallels other than the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea has so many parallels to the church today, which of course is 1900 all the way up to the present day. The church of Laodicea. And that's why we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Revelation 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. 
So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, as I said, the meaning of the name of the church in the Greek tells us a lot about what this church looks like. So what does the name Laodicea mean? It's, in Greek, it's Laodikei, Laodikei, and it's made up of two different Greek words. You first of all have Laos, which means people, and then you have Dike, which literally means verdict or opinion. So what this literally means, Laodikei, it means people's opinions. That's literally the meaning of this church, people's opinions. That is what the church of Laodicea was like, and guess what? It's exactly what the church is like today, isn't it? People's opinions. People's opinions superseding the word of God. It's exactly what we see today. Exactly how it was in the church of Laodicea and exactly how it is today. People thinking that their own opinions, their own feelings and their own emotions can override what the word of God says. This is the age we live in today, isn't it, brothers and sisters? They read these things in scripture and it's like, well, that's... That's your interpretation, you know, it's all based on interpretation, isn't it? Well, first, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. People make up these things as they go along. If it doesn't sit well with their own feelings or their own emotions, I'll just play the interpretation card. This is exactly what we see in the church today, isn't it? Now, many of you know that I'm not a fan of John MacArthur. However, in his debate against a uh, United Methodist bishop by the name of Melvin Talbot, I was 100% in MacArthur's camp. Basically what MacArthur was claiming is that there is only one God and there is only one way to him, Jesus Christ, amen. Melvin Talbot, on the other hand, says this, and this is a quote, direct quote, my God is large enough to be inclusive of all human beings who are created in God's image. And that includes those religions that are not Christian. Melvin Talbot doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. The God that Melvin Talbot believes in, he has made up in his own mind. The God that he believes in doesn't exist. It exists only in his own mind. Why? Because people's opinions. It's his opinion. The fact that there's a God and that there's one way to him through Jesus Christ doesn't sit well with him. Therefore, he has to make up his own opinion and think that that can override what the word of God says. Laodicea, it literally means people's opinions. This is the age we live in now, isn't it? We have people like Rob Bell who say that God doesn't send anyone to hell. God is a God of love and he would never condemn anyone to hell. Oprah Winfrey says that Jesus Christ cannot be the only way to God. Now she calls herself a Christian. This woman calls herself a Christian and yet she says Jesus Christ cannot be the only way to God. You can either believe Oprah Winfrey or you can believe Jesus Christ. You can't believe both. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So because of their own opinions and their own emotions and their own feelings, they make, up, they make it up as they go along. They pick and choose from the Bible what they want to believe and what they don't want to believe. They treat it like a cafeteria. We've all been in a cafeteria, haven't we? Oh, that looks nice. I'll have some of that. Yeah, not sure about that. That doesn't look too good. I think I'll leave that. That's exactly how people were treating the Bible today in the church of Laodicea, isn't it? It doesn't sit well with my opinions, and therefore I'm going to believe what I want to believe. We have so-called Christians who say that not all of the Bible is the word of God. Oh, you know, if you, if you play these, you know, if you play this card, oh, no, 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 not all of the Bible is the word of God. You can't trust it all. They obviously don't believe Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I commanded you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. Proverbs 30, verses 5 to 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and be found a liar. 
And finally, of course, Revelation 22, one of the last verses in the whole Bible. Revelation 22, 18 to 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add him to the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Brothers and sisters, be very, very careful about adding to or taking away from the word of God. If you add to the word of God, you'll be added to the plagues that are described in it. If you take away from the word of God, your share in the tree of life will be taken away from you. Be very careful about adding to or taking away from the word of God. When people disagree with the Bible, when people do not like what the Bible says, what they're really saying deep down is, if I was God, this is what I would be like. If I was God, this is how I would do things. That's really what they're saying. It's their pride, isn't it? They don't want to submit to the one true God. They don't want to submit to his words or his teaching. And therefore, if I was God, this is what I would do. This is how I would be. This is what people are really saying. It isn't because they disagree with us. It isn't because they disagree necessarily with the Bible. But it's because they disagree with Jesus. They disagree with the doctrines and teachings of Jesus Christ. This is why they don't agree with the Bible or with us. It's because they don't agree with Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 4. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Understands nothing. God's words there, not mine. If people don't agree with the words of Jesus Christ, they understand nothing. And that's why we have so-called Christians today who support same-sex marriage. That's why we have so-called Christians today who think that abortion is a good thing. That's why we have so-called Christians today who say that men can be women and women can be men. We have Christians today who believe this. They call themselves Christians and they believe this garbage. Now, we live in a free country. You are free to believe what you want. If you want to believe that God blesses same-sex marriage, then go ahead and believe that. You're free to believe that if you want to. If you want to believe that murdering babies in their mother's wombs is a human right, then go ahead and believe that. You're free to believe that. No one's stopping you. If you want to believe that men can use the ladies' bathroom, believe that. There's nothing stopping you believing that. But do not call yourself a Christian. You have no business calling yourself a Christian if you do not agree with the sound words of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Number one trait of the church of Laodicea, people's opinions. What else did we see? Verse 15. Let's go back to verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. They were lukewarm Christians. What do we see today? Lukewarm Christians everywhere. Now people's interpretation of what a lukewarm Christian is may differ. You know, to some it might be someone like I just described, someone who doesn't actually believe the whole word of God, someone who doesn't believe that the Bible is actually God's word. It could be someone who's living in sin habitually, calling themselves a Christian, and yet as soon as, they're, as soon as they go home, they're living in all kinds of sin and debauchery. So people's definition of a lukewarm Christian may differ. However, we can, we can all agree that a lukewarm Christian is someone who is not committed to the word of God and not committed to Jesus Christ. That is what a lukewarm Christian is, carnal, living in carnality, and all kinds of depravity. James chapter 4, verse 4 says that if you are a friend of the world, then you are an enemy of God. We have Christians today who call themselves saved believers who are in friendship with the world, doing things which other you know, non-Christians do. People who are not Christians, and they're taking part in all kinds of things which the Bible condemns. This is what lukewarm is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 says, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and drink of the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the Lord's table and partake in the table of demons. Lukewarm. And this is why we have lukewarm converts because we have lukewarm preachers, don't we? Lukewarm preachers produces lukewarm converts. This tells us also that God hates a mixture. There's many things in the Bible you can draw from this, the fact that God hates a mixture. For example, in the Old Testament, there's various laws which tells us that God does not like things mixed. People often struggle to understand why some of these laws are in the Old Testament, 
They have various typological meanings. They are often pagan practices as well. That's why a lot of these things are forbidden in the Bible. However, if you look at, for example, Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 to 11, it says, You shall not sow your vineyard with two different kinds of seed. God hates a mixture. You shall not plough with an ox and a donkey together, unequally yoked. Talks about being unequally yoked, doesn't it, in 2 Corinthians 6. You shall not wear a garment of wool and linen mixed together. Why? Because God hates a mixture. God loves purity. He doesn't like hot mixed with cold, does he? 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? God hates a mixture. He does not like mixing things together. He likes purity. So the second trait that we draw there from the church of Laodicea is their lukewarmness. The fact that they were neither hot or cold, they were lukewarm. And that's, of course, where the term lukewarm Christian comes from. It comes directly from Revelation chapter 3. Let's continue, verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, the city of Laodicea is found in what is now today Turkey. But the city of Laodicea was a very wealthy city, and the church was a very wealthy church. Does that remind you of anything or anybody? Exactly how the church is today, isn't it? It's all based on money, prosperity gospel. It's exactly what we're seeing today. They were all putting their trust in their wealth, in their possessions. And Jesus here says to them, well, you think that you're rich and wealthy and have need of nothing. But in reality, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked spiritually. Physically, they had everything. Physically, they had a lot of wealth. But spiritually, they were bankrupt. They were poor, uh, wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And it's exactly how it is today. These churches who, are, who, are, who have millions of dollars coming in every month. You know, Kenneth Copeland is the world's richest pastor. He's worth three quarters of a billion dollars. Three quarters of a billion dollars Kenneth Copeland is worth. And of course, Joel Osteen, his church brings in about $43 million a year just on passing the bucket around amongst the congregation. That's how much money these people bring in. And because we don't like to talk about things like, like judgment or hell or sin or repentance anymore, the incentive now to become a Christian is, oh, God's going to bless you and God's going to make you rich. God's going to give you a wonderful life. He's going to give you a promotion. He's going to give you a wonderful car, wonderful house. And this is what these people are telling people is the incentive to become a Christian. If you become a Christian, then your life is going to be wonderful. Well, the Bible says quite the opposite. If you become a Christian, you're going to suffer and you're going to get persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, God doesn't want anyone to be poor. Poverty, of course, is one of the curses as a result of sin. God doesn't want people to be poor. But when people are putting their trust in their money and their wealth and their riches, this is an abomination according to Revelation 3. And that's how much people determine. They determine how blessed... A congregation is or how blessed a person is by how rich they are that's how much people are determining it now but what the bible says according to according to first kings 3 solomon asked for what he asked for wisdom didn't he he didn't ask for riches god said i'll give you whatever you want and solomon asked for wisdom how blessed you are is how much wisdom you have not how much money you have how blessed this congregation is is not how much money we have, it's how much wisdom we have as a congregation, isn't it? Wisdom is the barometer of blessings, not money. In the Laodiceans, it was money. It was what they were putting their trust in. And guess what? It's exactly how the church is today. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be blessed. And God wants you to prosper. The prosperity gospel is taken over, hasn't it? The reason that these prosperity gospel teachers have such a huge following is basically a fulfillment of 2 Timothy chapter, th uh, chapter 4 verses 3 to 4. For the time is coming when people will no longer endure sound teaching but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So they don't want to listen to solid teachers like A.W. Tozer or David Wilkerson or Leonard Ravenhill or Chuck Smith. Oh no, we don't want to hear them. We want to hear these deceivers like Jesse Duplantis or Kenneth Copeland or Joyce Meyer who's going to lie to us and tell us that we're going to be rich if we come to Christ. That's what people are looking for these days, isn't it? So they're the three main traits 
of the church of Laodicea. Remember, a literal church which existed in the first century, but also a picture of what the church looks like today. The three main traits there of Laodicea. People's opinions, the prosperity gospel, and of course, Jesus here, in verse 18, has the solution to the problem now. This is where the exhortation comes in. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. So what you're saying is, in other words, you, the gold you have now is worthless. The gold you have now is going to perish. You can't take that gold with you when you stand before the Lord. You came into the world naked and you're going to leave naked as well. You will not be able to take all this gold and wealth with you. I counsel you to buy the gold from me. What is the gold bought from Jesus? The gold refined in the fire. What does refined in the fire mean? It means purified, doesn't it? They used to purify gold by refining it in the fire. That you may be rich. Spiritually rich. G Jesus is talking spiritually now. They were, they were physically rich, physically wealthy, but now Jesus is talking spiritually now. Buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Now, of course, gold as well has to do with heaven, doesn't it? It's a heavenly typology that we see. In Revelation 21, 21, it says that the heavenly Jerusalem, the streets are all made of gold, aren't they? And what else does Jesus say? And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So, again, he's, he's saying here things that they can relate to because there is a wealthy city, wealthy church. They obviously walked around with expensive clothing, expensive garments. But Jesus is saying the same thing here. These expensive garments that you're walking around in, they're worthless. They're useless. They're going to perish. You can't take them with you. He's saying, buy from me white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So what are these garments Jesus is talking about? Isaiah 61 verse 10. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He's saying, don't put your hope and trust in this wealth and in this expensive clothing that you're walking around in, but get the garments from me, the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. This is how we should be dressed. Not in expensive clothing, but in the clothing that Jesus has given us. The Bible talks about clothing ourselves with Christ, doesn't it, in Romans 13? Clothe yourself with Christ. And of course, the Laodiceans were clothing themselves spiritually with what? Their own righteousness. This is why Jesus is saying, get the garments from me, because their own garments were like filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Our own righteousness, our own righteous deeds are like filthy rags to God. And of course, it's white garments, isn't it? What does white typify in the Bible? White typifies purity. Again, it's talking about purity. We've had the lukewarmness. God hates a mixture. We've had the gold refined in the fire, pure gold, and now pure white garments. This is what white typifies in the Bible, purity. Revelation 7, you have a multitude standing before the throne of God in heaven, and they're all dressed in what? White robes. In Revelation 19, Jesus is coming what? In a white robe. And the high priest on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur every year would enter the Holy of Holies, and he would not wear his normal priestly garments, but he'd have a one-off garment that he'd wear once a year, every day on the, on the Day of Atonement, and that would be the white garments, the white garments with the red uh, sash. So this is how we are to be dressed. We are to be dressed in the righteousness of God, not in our own righteousness, because our own righteousness stinks, doesn't it? Our own righteousness are like filthy rags, but we are to be dressed in his righteousness, clothe ourselves with Christ. Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief, Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments on, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What did Jesus say? Buy from me white garments that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. So the shame of the nakedness, that's sin, isn't it? When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they were ashamed because of their nakedness. It's all to do with sin, isn't it? In Song of Songs, chapter 5, Song of Songs is all about the groom coming for the bride. And of course, in chapter 5, that's the bride who wasn't ready and took her garment off. She took her garment off, didn't she? And then she went to the door and the groom was gone. He'd gone and she went out into the streets looking for her loved one and the watchman beat her and took away her veil. So that's what happens when you take the garment off. We've got to keep the garments on. In Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast, what happened? The king had a wedding for his son, 
The ones who were invited didn't want to come, so he said, go out into the highways and byways and invite everybody who you see. So the wedding hall was full, and who was there in the wedding hall? Someone who did not have on the appropriate garments. Someone who was not dressed in the wedding garment. What did the king say? Take this man away, bind him hand and foot, and cast him into outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the garments that we are to be dressed in are the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness, which you can only get from Christ. You can't buy this in your expensive shops, you know, in town. You can only get this from Jesus. And this is what Jesus is saying to the Laodiceans here. Don't put your trust in your expensive clothing. Put your trust in the garments which I can give you, the robe of righteousness, the garments of salvation. What does he go on to say next? And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now you've got to remember, Jesus here is talking to the Laodiceans in a way which they can relate to. He's using examples of things that they're familiar with. In the first century, in the city of Laodicea, you had the medical school of Laodicea. It was famous for its medical school. And this medical school was famous for curing eye diseases. If you had an eye disease, the medical school of Laodicea in the first century was a place you went to. And they were famous for producing this, uh, this eye salve, this eye ointment, it was made from uh, these rare Phrygian stones, the powder from these rare Phrygian stones, and it made this special ointment which cured all kinds of eye disease. And of course, the city of Laodicea was famous for this. And it was something, of course, they boasted in a lot. You know, they boasted in their wealth, in their, in their, um, their health, the health system that they had. They boasted in all these things. But what he's saying is, you might think you have this eye salve, you might think you have this special eye ointment which can cure anybody, but you're blind. You're spiritually blind. Physically, you're okay. Physically, you're strong. Physically, you're wealthy. But spiritually, you're blind and poor and naked. So what he's saying is, get I salve from me. What is the I salve that Jesus offers us? The Holy Spirit. There's a third type of the Holy Spirit there. There's many types of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Liquids. So water being the main one. Rain and water typifies the Holy Spirit. I'll give you living water. Oil is another one. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. The, the five wise virgins and the five unwise virgins. The unwise virgins run out of oil, didn't they? So oil is a type of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. There is this third one here. It's the only time you see it in the Bible, but it is the eye salve. Eye salve which cures us, not of our physical blindness, but our spiritual blindness. I spoke about this a few weeks ago when we spoke about John chapter 9, about the guy who was healed from his blindness when Jesus spat in the clay and made the clay put the clay on his eyes and said, go and wash your face in the, uh, in the pool. And he was cured of his blindness. What is that? It's a picture of what happens to us. We are cured of our spiritual blindness. It's the same with Acts chapter 9 with Paul. Paul was blinded, wasn't he, by that light on the road to Damascus. And then Ananias was sent to him. And all of a sudden the scales fell from Paul's eyes and he received his sight back. It's a picture of what happened to you and I, brothers and sisters. I was blind, but now I see. Remember that? A famous hymn, I was blind, but now I see. So that's what that eye salve is for. Not the eye salve that you get from the Laodicean medical school, but from Jesus. The eye salve that he offers you is the Holy Spirit. The only reason that any of us today believe is because the Holy Spirit opened our eyes and cured us of our Spiritual blindness, not our physical blindness, but our spiritual blindness. We were all spiritually blind once, but now we have been given our sight back because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Uh, Amen. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Therefore be zealous and repent. Now, of course, this is talking about Proverbs 3 and Hebrews 12. The Lord disciplines those who he loves. If you are experiencing God's discipline, it is because he's treating you as one of his children. If he's not disciplining you, then according to the King James Bible, this is King James terminology now, you are a bastard child, illegitimate child. That means you are not one of God's. If you are not experiencing his, his discipline, it's because you are an illegitimate child. However, if he is disciplining you, then that means that you are his. You are, he's treating you as one of his own, just as a good father would discipline his child. Now what this tells us here, as many as I love are rebuke and chase and therefore be zealous and repent, is telling us that there were individuals in, those, in that church who were his, who were born again and did know him. There were individuals. And it's the same in the churches today. The churches might be apostate, the churches might be lukewarm, but there are individuals in those churches who are born again, 
but are suffering from spiritual starvation. They're not being fed, they're not being told the word of God, they're not uh, having quality fellowship with like-minded believers, they're dying of spiritual starvation. But they are born again and the Lord does know them. Churches do have these people in them. This is why now he begins to appeal not to the church, but to the individuals. From verse 20 now, he's going to make appeal not to the church, but to the individuals in that church. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now in Hebrew thought, this has to do with, with fellowshipping. Eating together is, uh, is when you become one with each other. That's why churches who eat together stay together. Churches who pray together stay together. And that's why when Jesus was eating with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors, the Pharisees were quite indignant, weren't they? He's eating with these sinners. Why? Because in Hebrew thought, eating together means to become one with each other. And that's why Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 5 that if there's a brother who is, a, who is in, in unrepentant sin, do not even eat with such a one. He's talking about fellowship. Now, if Jesus is knocking on the door, what does that tell us? It means he's on the outside, doesn't it? If Jesus is knocking on the door of the church, it means he's on the outside of the church. It's exactly how it is today, isn't it? The word of God is not in the church. Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. And the word of God is not welcome in the church anymore. You can go to sermons in churches and not hear one passage of scripture preached to you. All it is is a load of motivational speaking garbage. You can go to churches and not hear one passage of scripture. Or you might hear some scripture, but it's going to be very selective. You won't hear the stuff that people don't want to hear. You won't hear about judgment. You won't hear about hell or sin or repentance. Or they won't talk about transgenderism or homosexuality or abortion. Or they won't talk about replacement theology. No, we don't want to touch these things. Basically, Jesus is not welcome in the church anymore. Jesus is not welcome in these churches. Why? Because this word is not welcome in the church anymore. They don't like the word of God. And therefore, Jesus is on the outside now. He's on, he's on the outside knocking on the door. And that's why it's a privilege that we can say that Jesus Christ is welcome in this church because the word of God is welcome in this church, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Jesus is welcome in this church. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what that means is what we spoke about at the Feast of Tabernacles a couple of weeks ago. Jesus is returning to reign on David's throne. And you and I are going to reign with him as kings and priests. We are going to sit on those thrones and reign with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So we are going to reign with Christ as kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear. Again, the churches are apostate. The churches are backslidden. The word of God has gone out the window. Who's he appealing to now? Not the church, the individuals. He who has an ear, let him hear. The church of Laodicea turned its back on the word of God. And the church today has turned its back on the word of God. The churches are now apostate. They're lukewarm. They're Laodicean churches that we have now. And what does it say? I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you're lukewarm. Because you're neither hot nor cold. Now, it goes without saying, doesn't it? If you have cold water in your mouth and then you mix it with hot water, you can't just spit out the cold water. It's all mixed together now. You can't, the only option you have is to get rid of the lot. Isn't it? And that's why Jesus says, I'm going to vomit you out your mouth, out, out my mouth, because you are neither cold nor hot, lukewarm. And because the church has become apostate, because the church is lukewarm, because the church is Laodicean, this is why he is now appealing to the individuals, the faithful individuals in those churches to come out of her, my people. Revelation 18, come out of those Babylonian Laodicean churches. They are compromised. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now the only thing that I have to say to those who are lukewarm, to those who are backslidden, is Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day who you're going to serve. If you are a lukewarm believer, you must choose. The Bible says you must choose who you're going to serve. You can either serve Jesus Christ or you can serve the devil. There is no third option. There is no middle ground. 
There is no in between. God hates a mixture. It's one camp or the other. It's heaven or hell. It's black or white. It's smoking or non-smoking. They're the only two choices we have. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Those who choose the Lord Jesus Christ will follow him all the way to eternity in the kingdom of God. Those who choose the devil will follow him all the way to his place of judgment. Remember, the lake of fire was not made for you and I. It was not made for people. Matthew 24, 41. The lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's it. It was not made for anyone. No one has to go there. It was made for the devil. But anyone who chooses to identify with the devil, anyone who remains in his camp, is going to follow him all the way to his place of judgment. No one ever has to go there. It was not made for you and I. It was made for devils. The judgment place for devils. But those who have chosen to reject the garments of salvation, the eye salve, the gold refined in the fire, those who have basically stuck two fingers up to that precious gift are going to follow the devil to his place of judgment. The lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. No one ever has to go there. That's why the Bible says you must choose who you're going to serve. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey says. There is only one way to God and there is only way to heaven. That is through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our dear Saviour, our Lord and Saviour. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us give thanks in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for this day and for bringing us together. We thank you, Lord, that you have this example in your word. Not just the examples of what to do, but also of what not to do, Lord. What not to be like. And we thank you, Lord, that you have warned us against this Laodicean Babylonian teaching. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the gold refined in the fire. That you have given us the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. And that you have anointed our eyes with eye salve and opened our eyes to your truth and your word. We thank you, Lord, that even though once we were blind, we now see because the Holy Spirit has given us our spiritual sight and that we can now see the truth and not just see the truth, but love the truth. We know, Lord, that tolerating the truth is not enough. We know, Lord, that knowing the truth is not enough. But we know, Lord, that you are the way, the truth and the life. And therefore, we just commit our love to you, Lord. We love the truth. We love the word because you are the word, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we just pledge our love to you now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this word. And we thank you, Lord, for the warnings that you've given us. Help us to not be like those Laodiceans. Help us to not be lukewarm. Help us to not put opinions and emotions above your word, just as others are doing right now, Lord. But help us to be shining lights in the darkness, your faithful remnant. Help us, Lord, to proclaim that good news to others, in this, not just in this town, but in all over the world, Lord. May your word go forth and bring others into the kingdom. Snatch them, Lord, out of the kingdom of darkness and transfer them into the kingdom of light, Lord, we pray. Help us, Lord, to continue on that narrow way because we know that there is only one way and that it's not just the gate to life which is narrow, but it's also the way to life which is narrow. Help us to remain on that narrow way. Help us not to stray. Help us to not divert to the left or to the right, but to keep our eyes fixed firmly upon you, Lord. And Lord, we do thank you again for your Holy Spirit, which has given us life, for your resurrection, which is also going to be our resurrection, Lord, and that we will reign with you as kings and priests. We thank you, Lord, that that is what we can await in the kingdom of God, the inheritance of eternal life. And we thank you, Lord, that you have rescued us from that outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, but you have transferred us to an inheritance hidden for us, Lord, prepared for us in the kingdom of God. We give you all praise and thanks, Lord, for the blood of Jesus, which made this possible. We thank you for his sacrifice, which has saved us from all sin and all curses and all death. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for our salvation and our eternal life and forgiveness that you've given us. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you for these saints, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together today. But we give you all praise and thanks Above all, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Let's have some more worship.